Welcome everybody. Uh, in uh, only 30 seconds, probably been up and running, and uh, ready to start talking about um, challenges, pains, and uh, points of software development today. Dot next. Uh, there was a, a time not that many uh, weeks ago. I think it was a September, October time frame in which uh, internally under strict NDA at Microsoft there was a, a debate about uh, the name to use uh, for the upcoming bunch of frameworks and tools uh, that in particular I will talk about later this afternoon, ASP.NET 5, VNX, uh, those kind of things. The debate was about the name, the umbrella name for this uh, new bunch of frameworks. Uh, and I'm proud to say that my contribution to the debate was, uh, okay, let's call that dot .next. And, uh, well, when I submitted this, the reply was, okay, and what happens uh, when we release an update? Should we rename it back to dot .prev? So, dot .next remained the name for this beautiful conference. Okay, now, what is my contribution here to this uh, conference? The world, as we see it, the world of software, is being entirely rebuilt in software, period. So, companies all over the world, from Finland to the uh, United States, yeah, <laughs> to Australia, to every other part of the world, what they are doing is rebuilding everything in software, using software, using code, and there are a few consequences. One of which is every company now is going to be a tech company. Regardless of the core business, they need to be deeply involved internally or via outsourcing with tech, strong tech content. Every company, that's another consequence, needs now strong talents and talent is lacking. So every company faces a big challenge today, which is uh, getting talent. So a new term has been coined, acquire people. But actually, many companies are just trying to acquire fish. And uh, still, in my opinion, and in my experience also, not that many companies are making plans to teach people how to fish. And uh, if I try to take this point up to a conclusion, towards a conclusion, I would say that there is still all over the world a huge barrier between what is a theory that is being taught most of the time at school, at universities, and the practice of the real world. So in summary, there is just shortage of senior people all over the world. Okay, what it means now to be a software writer? So as a developer, as an architect, uh, as a professional involved in software, there are a few challenges for us to face, the most important of which I consider to be the analysis of the business domain. For many, many years, and this is one of the most important factors in the theory versus practice point I just made, is that we grew up, and we still grow up people, with the idea of modeling. But actually, modeling involves building a sort of a virtual model. What we really need to do instead is mirroring the business domain. And there is a fantastic tool. It's called the DDD, Domain Driven Design, which is a methodology, it's an approach to development that has been mistaken in 10 years, in its first 10 years of life, has been mistaken for things it's not really good at. And the, the things that DDD is really good, great at, have been, for what I can say, what I have seen, these things have been neglected to some extent. 
And then it comes implementation. Implementation is not necessarily about technology. It's, yeah, it's still about technology, but the role, the overall role of the technology is probably much less important than the road that takes to choosing a technology and to devise an implementation. Simplicity, again, that's the key word, another key word. Again, in the past, we, we've been taught when we graduated that we have to model, we are responsible for understanding, for, for understanding the pertinent terms in the object model we're going to build. This is the foundation of object orientation, right? So, modeling, modeling, modeling. And uh, maybe because of the ego of developers, maybe because of the ego of professors who taught us. But the fact is that we tend to model too much, way too much. And we lose perspective most of the time on the simplicity of things, on what really is required in business. So we focus on, we should focus a lot more on tasks and keep simplicity as our vector that shows direction. Uh, if you want to find something more concrete and specific, there is a methodology that I describe in my, in my, uh, sorry for the shameless plug, in my, in my book, it's called the UX first uh, methodology, which essentially is nothing, you know, fancy. It's just a top-down approach that I have seen in various ways implemented already in several companies all over the world. But that puts a lot more emphasis on uh, the presentation, on the flow of tasks. It's a task-based approach that puts the experience, the, end ex the experience of end users, the UX factor at the top. Technology is a mere infrastructure. And, uh, but it's, this is not necessarily a statement that reduces the role of technology. Mere infrastructure simply means that technology is fundamental. It has to be chosen with care, extreme care. It must be handled with extreme care. But it's not the technology that makes the product. The God anti-pattern. Developers are have a, you know it, it, it's it's part of the nature of developers to feel like God and create the world when we create when we're called to create a product to we, we think about something, oh, you, you feel like God, oh, what can I create today? This is the, this is the wrong point. I mean, the, uh, this reminds me of a cartoon when I was a boy, some 44, yeah, 40 years ago, uh, in which uh, there was uh, the scientist with uh, his you know, white dress, uh, going into the office and say, you know, looking into, sitting at the desk and say, look, okay, what can I invent today? But there was a cartoon. And still, look, it seems to me that many developers uh, take this approach when they face a new project. Actually, the virtual reality that too many developers try to consider when they approach a project is just virtual reality that potentially serves a, a less than optimal experience to the paying customers. And more importantly, in doing so, you potentially miss some uh, requirements, whether functional or non-functional. Okay, I'm com I confess that I'm very, very sensitive on this point uh, uh, because of the experience, the project I'm on these days, uh, I'm basically rebuilding, helping rebuild an entire piece of infrastructure because of the God anti-pattern, because of all of the things that have I just mentioned. But actually, if you're not convinced yet about the God anti-pattern, the bad effects of the God anti-pattern, think about this. Uh, if surgeons were like software, many software architects actually are, so suppose that they open up your body and they find out, oh, 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 where is the gallbladder? Uh, okay, something around the liver, right? I, I don't know if it's right or left, but it doesn't matter. Around the liver, right? 
and they know because they studied how the what is the typical shape of a gallbladder and they know about that but because they at the beginning they studied on books and when they open up your body they may find out that your gallbladder is uh, right i mean is as expected or is unusual it takes an unusual form it's too big too small but surgeons don't care they just hopefully you know <laughs> oops they just hopefully go on thankfully they don't assume that your gallbladder has a canonical gallbladder but sometimes software architects just assume that if the world is not what they think it should be they fail anyway uh, when it comes to modeling there are many many acronyms yagni kiss dry uh, you are yagni you ain't gonna need it so don't write don't plan for features you don't strictly need at the time or dry don't repeat yourself or kiss okay keep it simple stupid uh, these are pure tautology at the architecture level. It's obvious that you don't want to have more than you strictly need when it comes to designing, planning, and architecture. But when it comes to coding, sometimes you, 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 you can have a little bit more than you strictly need. But this is a vector. But uh, Yagni is... Uh, not so important and the same is for dry and kiss because they are obvious at the domain at the level of domain analysis it's obvious tell don't ask that's another vector for developers and typically tell don't ask is not considered a uh, a vector, a driver that applies at the architecture level. It's, it's for developers. So when you design a class, tell, don't ask, recommends you look more at the behavior expected of the class from the class rather than the, the properties and the data it can contain. But actually, tell, don't ask is a lot more important at the architecture level. It's the real key thing because it helps you focusing on real tasks and the real business processes that you observe in the reality and that you have to mirror via software. Think ahead, that's another factor. Because uh, observing the reality, mirroring the reality, which means mirroring the real business processes of the customers, that's important. But the real added value that you can provide as a consulting company or just as a plain developer on a group is thinking ahead trying to imagine where the business can go understanding the mechanics of the business domain this comes with uh, experience it takes time but understanding the inherent mechanics of domains is really a kind of skill in a particular business segment that can make the difference between a regular developer and a top developer. Also, solid that a lot of people, including myself, have been promoting over the past few years as the winning factor for the green economy, for the green software, for... Oh, <laughs> I remember the first time I, I had a session, in, it was a, a conference in the United States about solid, a single responsibility, open close, the list of uh, dependency injection, these kind of things. It was some. Uh, it was in the middle of the crisis in 2008-2009, and uh, okay, I gave my presentation. And then I got a question from the audience saying, "What is the relationship between solid and green economy?" Oh my God! <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> oh my God! Uh, well, uh, yes, I, I, I think, and then, you know, uh, in, in a pure genius, okay, I, I, I said, well, because uh, in solid, you, you, you can save a lot of CPU cycles, and that helps the world to be greener. <laughs> great answer, great answer. Well, pure genius, and genius is when you take out something of your brain 
that you didn't know it was there. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just an immediate answer. Anyway, uh, behavior as a way to mirror the happenings, the things that really happen in the real world is fundamental. When you analyze a domain, in a domain you find entities, you find action on entities, you find processes and relationships, uh, and you have to make sense of those things. The domain and the behavior comes your way, is exposed to you through a business lingo. It's a, it's a jargon. Every company, every domain, every business has a jargon. And that is the language that requirements come your way. But, uh, okay, this jargon has to be understood. You must be able to speak that jargon. Okay, it, it takes time, but, you know, this is when you can call yourself a domain expert, right? But actually, the point that many still miss is that this business lingo, this jargon, has to be fully reflected in software. This is the key point of mirroring. Because if you understand that, say, an order in the business domain has to be at some point cancelled, and that's the language that users use to explain what they want to you, and then in code you still insist in deleting a record, there is a conflict. Cancel an order is equivalent to delete a record. But uh, different words Different verbs, different languages are used to describe the same thing. And in the long run, during the lifetime of the project, this can only create further conflicts, misunderstandings, leading to bad assumptions, and in the end, leading to code that is not perfect. Is uh, In the end, it turns out to be a less than optimal experience. Want to see an example? Okay, now, how would you describe and a simple, very simple thing like a sport game. Imagine uh, something like uh, the game starts. It can be basketball, it can be football, it can be water polo, whatever you want. The game starts, a period starts, and then uh, there's a loop waiting for any goal to be scored. If the goal is scored, you do something, otherwise you wait for the end of time. Uh, and the period, end of game, finish game, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is the regular flow chart for, uh, for a game. This is the class that I think 95 probably percent of developers would use, would consider a good approach, a good way to describe a system, to implement a system that deals with sports games. This class just contains uh, properties with public getters and setters, but just describes. It's a data container, but it matches, carefully matches what could be, what will likely be the record in some uh, relational database where uh, the data is actually stored. What about this instead? Okay, beyond the point that this is a unit test, which is not coincidental. But uh, we now have a match class that looks fairly different. There are no properties, or just probably a few properties, but read only properties. And there are lots of methods. So you can out of the new definition of the match class, you can now describe a use case using nearly the same language of the business. Uh, you start the match, start period, goal for home, goal for home, end period, start period, goal for visitors, end period, start period, end period, no goals. Start period, goal for home, end period, finish match, what's the score? 3-1. That's an API that describes exactly what users may have asked you to create. It's an API that reflects, that mirrors, actually, the business process. Because when you get requirements for such a thing, 
Your customers will tell you that, okay, what's a match? A match starts, a match ends. The referee or the assistant will actually score, officially track on the scorecard that a goal has been scored. It uses the whistle to set the end of the beginning of a time, of a period of time, first, second, half, whatever. These are the, this is the lingo and uh, it's key for the success of the project to have the business lingo reflected, fully reflected in software. Behavior-centric design. Now, tools we have, concrete tools we have to improve our skills in a domain analysis. Domain-driven design, the blue book, which was published, written and published by Eric Evans some 10 years ago, so DDD, Domain Driven Design, has been around for about a decade with a mission of tackling complexity in the heart of software. Uh, okay, this book is, uh, is a milestone. It's a great book. Fantastic book that really changed something in the history of software development because of its innovative guidelines, which essentially can be summarized by saying that it taught, it, it is trying to teach architects and developers to write software driven by the real nature of the domain, starting from the lingo. The book contains a set of prescriptions, similarly to the prescriptions that the doctor gives you when your gut, blood, or hearts. And uh, over, overall, it has been perceived has an all or nothing approach. And this probably represented uh, the source of some uh, misunderstanding about DDD. Because DDD, in summary, was perceived, it's still mostly perceived, as, oh, build a fantastic, beautiful object model. It's called the domain model. You build it, oh, model. And model, oh, God, and I'm God. The developers stop there and say, oh, finally, thanks God, I have budget to sit down, take my time to rebuild this piece of business, the God anti-pattern. Domain-driven design is not exactly about that. It's the perception that it's all about having a rich, behavior-centric, but still rich domain model. In a domain-driven design, there are two distinct parts. You always need one. And you can sometimes blissfully ignore the other. There is an analytical part and there is a strategic part. The analytical part is valuable to every project and to everybody. The strategic part is, okay, given the analysis tools, what comes out of the analysis still needs implementation. And DDD offers one possible recommended supporting architecture, which has to do with having a rich domain model. But that's just one possible way of looking at things. The real value of DDD that is not that much perceived of what I, for what I can say and can see is the analytical part. And how would you conduct analysis using DDD? You have two tools, the most important of which is called the ubiquitous language. Now, ubiquitous language is a, is a term of DDD. We can call it as a DDD key pattern. Uh, ubiquitous language is uh, just a formulation of what I said I, I called reflecting the business lingo. That, that's it, that's the point. It involves uh, tasks that take you to creating a vocabulary of terms, business terms, and more importantly, sharing this vocabulary, this glossary, with all of the people involved in the project at all levels, all stakeholders, all other developers, all teams, and using this uh, glossary of terms to refer to business tasks in every form of spoken and written communication. This ensures that whatever term, whatever 
verb, whatever sentence is being said, it's fully understood. It tries to remove at the root any risks of misunderstanding and bad assumptions. And second point, as you explore the requirements to figure out the glossary of terms, you may sometimes run into situations where different words are used to indicate the same thing or the same thing is, is, is described using different words by different people within the same organization. Uh, this means that you probably crossed the invisible boundary that exists between a, a huge domain and some of autonomous subdomains. In the DDD jargon, a subdomain is called a bounded context. So, in the end, the primary result of a DDD analysis is identifying the bounded context, so the areas of the domain that are better treated independently. Shaping a bounded context is challenging, but that's all the point. That's the work. That's the added value. So after you conduct a DDD analysis in summary, you end up having what is called a context mapping. A context mapping is just a graph with uh, nodes that represents bounded context. One, two, three, four, just a few typically. And uh, the final step of a DDD architect is uh, determining the relationships existing between uh, the identified bounded context. In a DDD there are uh, symbols like U and D that indicate which of the node is a master. U stands for upstream master and D indicates downstream or slave. So, for example, between core domain and back office, you can expect to have a, a UD a kind of relationship also called customer supplier or master slave, indicating then core domain may change the public API without notice and it's the responsibility of the back office to reflect and to be updated when something changes in the core domain. Uh, you can also have uh, instead a partner uh, relationship, for example, between this demo back office and club site. Partner means that the teams in charge for developing the back office and the club site work at the same level of responsibility. So if one of the teams needs to make changes, feels the need of making changes to the public API, that those changes are to be mutuated, are to be agreed with the other team because they work in partnership. And it's the architect that determines the nature of those relationships. Third case is when you have a dependency on an external domain that you don't own. Uh, weather forecasts there just is uh, an external service that you need to incorporate in your uh, project but you don't control, none of your teams controls the source code of that module. So the API, say, of the weather forecast service may change without notice and any change may introduce breaking changes in some of the modules. In this case, introducing an anti-corruption layer saves your life because an anti-corruption layer is a proxy that you control and is this proxy that manages possible changes coming from the, out, the external dependency. So the implementation of the club site never needs to change. All of the changes are limited in the anti-corruption layer. These are, this is the foundation of the DDD 
analysis summarized in just a few moments. Okay, back. Now, each of the graph of the nodes you find in this graph, which are bounded contexts, for each of those, it's your responsibility to find the most appropriate implementation. And uh, this introduces the term, the, the idea of a supporting architecture. Supporting architecture is just any pattern, any architecture level pattern for building a piece of software. So it could be multi-tier, it could be client server or two-tier, it could be crude, it could be, or it could also be a domain model. Domain model has, has been, you know, popular, made popular by typical understanding of domain-driven design so far. So a domain model means building a full, rich, all com comprehensive, all encompassing domain model where you have classes and relationship and entities and behavior, blah, 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 a big model describing the logic of the system. But now, not the entire system, just a bounded context, so a piece of the system that you identified in your analysis. Now, a domain model in DDD is exactly what the words used indicate, a domain model, so a model for the domain. There is nothing in the, term, in the two words domain model, nothing that associates this with the object orientation. The domain model, okay, most likely will be an object oriented model. But latest development in the DDD community also are introducing the, a functional way, f sharp driven way, of creating a model. So a model for the domain, uh, software tools, a software API to deal with the tasks, the processes in the domain. This is a domain model. Another interesting architecture is a CQRS which still needs a model for the domain, but it makes things even simpler because uh, it splits the complexity in two parts. Com CQRS stands for Command and Query Responsibility Segregation. So it's based on uh, a simple fact. When you perform an action in software, well, you, at the end of the day, you can do one of two things. You can issue a command that alters the state of the system, or you can query for data, which is an action that delivers data back to the caller without altering the current state of the system. So it's a common or it's a query. It's never the same thing at the same time. And it cannot be anything beyond being a common or a query. So CQRS is just an architecture that splits, that recommends you have separate stacks for handling commands and queries, which introduces yet another level of simplification. We already had a bounded context to split, to partition, the otherwise huge all-encompassing model in smaller blocks. And then with CQRS, each of those blocks we split into comments and queries. So in the end, you have a very simple, very simple, or the simplest they can be, set of entities and behavior to deal to truth and for which to choose the best supporting architecture. Uh, when it comes to CQRS, CQRS can be considered the new crude. Because uh, think, there's really no reason in the read stack of a CQRS solution, there is really no need to have anything more complicated than just a bunch of SQL queries. Maybe with a link to entities, entity framework, whatever. You don't need to have anything complex like, you know, layers of repositories. You don't need to have, uh, uh, I don't know, 
DTOs, uh, you don't need to have adapters, just plain query. That's it. Just a query. More. Because the stacks are separated, you can optimize query and common stacks independently. If you have a serious scalability concerns, then you can even consider using different databases for storing the state and at the same time in sync, in parallel, or even with some delay, updating another database that you only use for queries, where some backend tool asynchronously prepare data, aggregates of data ready for the presentation, so that the query just goes straight, grabs records with no extra operations. And because it's an async stuff that takes place on the server, you have plenty of chances to optimize that. You can even offload the read stack to another bunch of servers. Use all level of caching you want. So you have the power of optimizing your solution as, it, as you need it to be. This is the power of CQRS. And okay, even bosses and even sourcing, that they introduce yet another level of sophistication on top of architectures. Because uh, even sourcing is another point, but it's, uh, you know, it has little to do with pure architecture. It's more closer to implementation details. Even sourcing is the idea that your stored information are not data, but just events. Uh, when we store data, we have a model. We, we call it uh, the data model, the SQL relational data model, but it's a model. Any model is uh, a constraint in the end because you are forced to constrain what you see, what happens in the real world to a model. In the real world, what we observe are events, are business events. There are no models in the world. Each event brings data, but, you know, data is, uh, is flat data. In the same domain, you can have a bunch of different events, and each event can bring a different set of data. When you create a, a relational model to store, the, to create your data source, well, you, you are automatic, for the simple fact that you do that, you are constraining flat data into a fixed model. You are potentially losing information. Events, even sourcing says, okay, look, find a way to store just events as they are, as they come. And then on top of the data source based on events, you can create as many models as you like. The reason why we tend to store information using a relational data model is because it makes it so easy for us to query. But you can use event sourcing, save events as they are flat data, and then asynchronously with a trigger maybe on the on some uh, Raven DB, Mongo DB, SQL DB, why not? We create a classic relational model for the purposes with ag data aggregates ready for the presentation needs. But there's another scenario, business intelligence. When a company to these days uh, hires another company to do, to conduct some business analysis to improve sales typically, BI companies need to put your hands on your sales data and uh, they need to build their own object model in order to run their own queries, cubes, these kind of things. So you pay probably more the, the services because they have to extract your data, 
massage that data into cubes and then run queries, BI queries. If you can provide an even source, you, you make this work probably simpler. Or you can run BI, simple BI analysis yourself. So, even sourcing is yet another level. It's a relatively new thing, but it, 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 it's one of the aspects that, architecturally speaking, are relevant, but they mean nothing outside the context of a DDD analysis. Now, implementation, UX first. This is a, okay, UX first is just a fancy name that I coined to indicate an approach, a methodology that is not really fancy. It's just, you know, putting together things, common sense rules. Actually, in a UX first, uh, there are two professional figures working together. The software architect, the blue pill, which does whatever we typically associate with the idea of an architect. So running interviews to collect requirements, business information to build the domain layer. And then the, the, the red pill is the UX architect, which runs interviews to collect usability requirements and build the ideal user experience for the presentation layer. Domain layer, presentation layer, no mention for the data layer. The business stuff goes into the domain layer in a DD division of the world. Now, does it mean that you have to hire two people? Uh, yes and no, it depends. Uh, what is uh, relevant here is that there are two distinct professional roles that can be covered, why not, by the same individual. So I'm talking about skills. These skills may belong to the same individual or different individuals. Responsibilities of a UX expert. In first place, UX is different from UI. UI is part of UX, but UX focuses on the architecture of the information, how you aggregate, how you present, how you organize data, and how you think the interaction between users and the system. In UML, there is a, a diagram called the use case diagram, okay, that describes, is expected to describe just the interaction between actors, the system, and the user. It, it, it's that, I mean, it's exactly that. More importantly, the UX architect has to run, organize usability reviews, which essentially says that he has to observe users live in action to identify bottlenecks in the experience. I mean, when developers uh, write apps, even under the guidance of UX designers and experts, not necessarily they do it right at the first time. Not because you hire a super UX expert, things go straight the first time. I mean, it could be that you, you, you devise a sequence of steps, a sequence of, of user interfaces that apparently are good, great, and then in action, when they are actually you know, put in production, things turn out to be not as smooth as you expected. So reviewing is key to just streamlines bottlenecks. The focus is not graphics, of course, but it's data flow. So, in summary, in extreme synthesis and summary, uh, UX first design is, uh, can be you know, restricted to the basic flow chart that follows. For each screen you intend to present to users, step one is determine what comes in and out of the screen, of the form and create appropriate classes to describe 
what comes in and what comes out. Uh, using uh, .NET-ish terminology, we can call these classes as input model and view model. The input model is that the data that, say, in ASP.NET MVC goes through the model binding layer and is passed to controllers. And uh, view models are the classes that the controllers produce and then pass to the view engine for producing the actual HTML that goes back to browsers. But in the end, it's classes that you know, represent the input for the screen and a class that represents the output of the screen that goes down to the back end for further processing. You can, uh, for the step one, produce also, you should produce also wireframes, screens, not mockups. A mockup is uh, a wireframe with uh, some CSS, some colors, some graphics. But the focus here is not graphics. So wireframes, so just uh, sketches with uh, layout and navigation information in is enough. Just to show users, okay, you at this stage, you are being displayed a screen with a combo box, a drop down, a list, buttons, this or that. You click here and you move to another screen with this content. Once you reach agreement with users, once you can sign off on the structure, the data flow, only at that point you start coding. So the step one, between step one and step two, you should expect to find a sort of sign off. So I mean, step one could be in a way the only step of a waterfall methodology, whereas what comes next, step two and step three, can be run in a classic agile manner and go through sprints. Or if you want to look at this from a unique agile perspective, I would say that step one is the sprint zero, it's very long sprint zero, and whatever follows is the classic sprints of an agile project. So once you know exactly what comes in and out of each of the screens you're gonna have, then you just create endpoints for the application layer. The application layer is the topmost part of the back end. It, the part of the back end that just talks receives inputs and comments from uh, the presentation. It's where you have the orchestration of any workflows. And you're gonna have a, an application layer potentially distinct per each presentation you're gonna have. So if you have a website, you should expect to have an application layer for the use cases in the website. But if you, in the moment in which you add a mobile site or a mobile application, you may potentially need to extend, expand or recreate the application layer just to, the, to serve the needs of the use cases you're gonna have in the mobile app or the mobile site or this or that. Application layer is specific of the application. Underneath the application layer, you have the back end. The domain layer, where you have the business logic, which remains invariant for the domain. And then underneath, you then have some sort of persistence, which could be relational or polyglot, and using any things like NoSQL document databases, Mongo, this or that. In the end, the vision of UX first is you have a presentation layer and you sign off and then you have a black box. You have a underneath presentation, you have a set of endpoints, an interface, and what comes next is just a black box. So once you know exactly what you're going to produce, you can produce that regardless. And the, the benefit, the ROI of this approach is that once you sign off on the presentation, Top down, it's you know hard to expect the users to come back and say, Oh, this is not what we asked for. No, you signed off on that. We can argue about the performance. Okay, you, you can users can go back to you and say, Look, this is not as fast as I as I would expect it to be.
but they can hardly come back to you and say, look, this is not what I like. They can say, well, using this interface apparently was nice, but now as we use it, it's not as smooth as it should be. Good, UX architect at work or software architect at work to improve things, but not the, you know, the, the requirements chart, the requirements that change every day, it's most of the time because architects get it wrong. You missed, we miss requirements, we misunderstand, we make assumptions on requirements, and then we have customers coming back and say, oh, 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 oh. No, it's not because it, they change. What changes is uh, our understanding of those requirements. And I think, and what, this is what I'm doing, that UX first, which is not the silver bullet, but helps in minimizing the costs because it reduces the conflicts around a software project. Maintainability. This is the core top attribute of software. But I think that this uh, maintainability is key because uh, if the code is easy to maintain, you can evolve it in a simpler and cost-effective way. And uh, the idea of maintainable software goes with the idea that we have a fantastic, perfect, God-style object model behind. Greg Young is uh, a great name in this industry. Uh, Greg Young is one of the guys uh, who made popular the CQRS architecture and in my humble opinion CQRS is the next crude so it's the thing that we are going to do in the next 10 years that would be the mainstream kind of architecture for most software java.net because it's, it's not platform specific in the next 10 years. Greg Young, uh, in a few months ago, a couple of months ago, three months ago actually, uh, said something like, good long-term software is not commonly about reuse. What? Greg Young says it's not, it's not about reuse. He, he's, he's shaking the, the, the foundation, the pillars of the software world. It's not about reuse, it's about the ability to rewrite completely isolated bits without uh, causing the Big Bang. I totally agree. I probably could use myself better words. It's, you know, when I, I, I read this tweet, he said, oh, yeah, I had something like that in my mind, unable to express it. I, I totally agree. I think that this is a new definition of maintainability today. So stop thinking about building the super perfect model. Flat code, where you don't have that much that many levels. I mean, it happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we, I, I narrated a bunch of mobile apps written with Xamarin. But, but Xamarin, I mean, just to give you context, there's nothing bad uh, with Xamarin in this context, right? Uh, at some point, we decided for performance reasons to switch from, uh, don't laugh at me, but to switch from a native UI to a web-based UI, yeah, but for performance reasons, yeah, because the, we, we were dependent on uh, such horrible services that actually it was far significantly faster for us to create a web view on, this, on, on a new server and send HTML and display HTML than waiting for the services to provide the JSON data for the native app to arrange the UI. So it was not summary, not it was just. But we, we could not rewrite the services. Okay, so that was a compromise, right? So, in order to make a, a call to, you know, to get, uh, to call a different endpoints, actually, for a matter of parameters to pass, we had to duplicate code. So we couldn't re, I mean, in the end, they were, the, the, the code was based on a stack making, in the end, an HTTP call. Okay, so nothing. So you change the URL or you, 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 you change the parameters on the HTTP client call and you're done. 
But it was so much nested in levels of classes with override of the override of the override, the abstract class, that actually to add an extra parameter to the first call in the chain, not to hitting the Big Bang, okay, we found, okay, it's much better if we duplicate the code. So we created another HTTP stack. This was only because of the excessive layers and layers, yeah, the, the application, blind application of OOP, object-oriented programming principles, solid and these kind of things. And when it comes to that, uh, how, I mean, it, it's unavoidable to think of what? Back in 94, so only a few years after, I graduated in 1990, okay? And uh, not me, but my colleagues uh, had a thesis on object orientation, which was uh, the, you know, at the front line of computer science. Four years later, so as people started practicing in real applications with object orientation, the gang of four published elements of reusable blah, 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 the popular book, and they say, don't use inheritance. <laughs> so four years later, they immediately figured out. And now, 25 years later, we are still thinking about inheritance? No, flat code, that makes it so easy to rewrite. And finally, Technology, gone are the days in which just upgrading to the next version of something fixes things. Technology today is infrastructure, so it's required. We cannot do anything without technology. It's critical, but it's serving a superior purpose. Technology is not the purpose, it's a mean. Like a medicine, can't be wrong <laughs> if you take the wrong medicine. Well, something really bad can happen. A medicine must serve a purpose, fix your gallbladder or your pain or whatever it is. A doc is required, and guess who's the doc? We are the doc. Thank you for your time.